Hi, everybody, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Foster Gamble, president and co-founder of Clear Compass Media, and the creator and host for an amazing new movie called Thrive. It's an unconventional documentary that lifts the veil on what's really going on in our world by following the money upstream and uncovering the global consolidation of power in nearly every aspect of our lives. Foster Gamble is a direct descendant of the late James Gamble, the soap maker and founder of Procter & Gamble, and his childhood in Cincinnati was one of position and privilege. He attended elite private schools and Princeton University, and he was groomed to be a leader in the establishment, but he chose a different path. As a young boy, Foster Gamble had a vision where he glimpsed what he perceived to be the universe's fundamental energy pattern. This experience led him to envision a universal energy source that could serve the world. And over the next 35 years, he immersed himself in science and in the exploration of consciousness and human potential, and he realized that both sets of skills would be needed to navigate the challenges threatening our very survival. Thrive represents the convergence of these two paths and puts into sharp relief the true reality of our existence in the 21st century. So I am so honored to welcome Foster Gamble. Welcome, Foster. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, watching the film was a riveting experience, and I am awestruck by all the effort behind it. Much of the information was material that I knew, but to have it all laid out in such a logical sequence, and then to be able to see how all the dots are connected, well, that was a sobering experience. (laughs) Thank you. It was a really, uh, one of our major challenges was uh, to put so much information in such a short amount of time. And that, frankly, was my major concern as to whether or not it would work. And many people advised us to, you know, just pick one of those topics and make a documentary out of it, you know, rather than a dozen of them. And But uh, we really felt, my wife Kimberly and I, uh, really felt like our main mission was to connect the dots in a way that hadn't been done before in one uh, piece of media, so that people could, in a brief sitting, actually get the coherence. Because uh, many of the topics on their own, whether it's UFOs or free energy or conspiracy or even the, the deeper aspects of liberty, can sound so bizarre that it can be so sort of socially ostracizing in most situations. But when the pieces are tied together, another story emerges which is so much more coherent and appeals to common sense way beyond what we're being told by the corporate media. And I'm happy to say that we're just getting thousands of letters from all over the world thanking us for exactly that aspect. So we're relieved that that worked. You you couldn't be more right because I've... You know, being in the business we are, I've seen many, many movies and read many books, each one uh, covering one or, or, or a few aspects. But to have it all tied together, as you say, is um, so convincing. And uh, I loved what you said at one point. You said, I could be wrong, but what if I'm not? <laughs> now, well, the, the, the film is a story of a personal journey. And I relate a lot of facts that I found, and those are all uh, confirmed by independent third-party sources and all put up on the Internet so that we don't have to spend a lot of time arguing over whether or not the Federal Reserve is really federal and Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, But I, I think it's really important also to realize that we each interpret what we observe in a different way. So I was sharing my story of discovery, uh, because many of the topics were so new to me at different times. I never set out to explore UFOs or even uh, free energy. Just one, one question led naturally to the next, and this uh, other uh, understanding began to emerge. But I want to be very clear to people that, that um, I'm relating a certain number of facts and then my interpretation of them, and I invite people to really entertain our story 
but not to believe it. I don't want anybody just uh, taking on a new belief system unquestioned. I'm, we're really interested in helping to promote critical thinking. So we spent three years building, building a website where you can go as deeply as you want in following up on further information so that uh, ultimately you get a critical mass of solid information so that you can really shape your own opinion that makes most sense to you of what's really going on and therefore what can we do about it. Well, we're going to go into your website and the whole Thrive movement uh, towards the end of the interview, but why don't we start with laying out at least some of the highlights of your documentary. You start by pointing out the chasm between the natural order, which is for life to thrive, and the fact that the majority of the people on the planet are barely surviving. That's why you called it Thrive. Well, that was the biggest dilemma in, in my life, is just the people that I know, for the most part, are so caring. I mean, if you're in trouble, they'll give you the shirt off your back. The, you know, you see in these various uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and so forth, you just see the goodness of humanity just shine. And with all of the technological capabilities that we have now and means of accessing different resources and so forth, I just could not figure out, as I was graduating from college uh, quite a while ago now, back in 1970, and looking around me and seeing that we were at the risk of a nuclear holocaust, we were invading Cambodia for no apparent reason that, that I could understand, um, and we were destroying our environment. And so many people were suffering. And just one war after another was going on. I, I just could not make sense of that. And so I really, uh, as I discovered at that time, that I was uh, inheriting some money from my grandparents. Uh, not a tremendous amount, but an, enough uh, that if I managed it carefully, I could choose what I wanted to do with my daily life. And it was like winning the lottery at a, an early age. I felt very blessed and also a big responsibility to not spend my life complaining about my job uh, uh, because I could do what I wanted. So I, uh, as I looked around, I had been a filmmaker in college, and I, I loved, I've always loved film, but I made enough films to realize, uh, these were short films, to realize that I had nothing to say at that point that was worth all of the money and time and technology and so forth uh, that it takes to create a feature film. So instead, I dedicated myself to, to exploring this question of what is in the way uh, of our thriving. And I told my friends at that time, if I find uh, a meaningful answer to that and a sense of the way out, then I'll make the, my next film. And I thought it would take a few years. Uh, it actually took 41 years before the coherence was there. Uh, and finally, this film is out. You know, coming from the privileged background that you did, um, it's heartening and uh, somewhat surprising that you turned to this kind of social commitment. Why do you think that happened? Well, it's an excellent question. I, I, I don't know, and I think that there are a number of factors that were involved that I am aware of. First of all, I, I was blessed with amazing parents. My mother was probably the most unconditionally loving person that I ever met until I met Kimberly. Uh, so growing up with her, I thought everybody's mom was like that and found out later on that's uh, far from the truth. Uh, and my dad was not such a, a heartfelt guy, but he was known in his community for absolute integrity. And growing up with those two role models just supported me in questioning things that a lot of people around me were just taking for granted. And then I think, you know, on more of a, of a spiritual consciousness level, um, I have been asking these questions since I was a very small child, and I, I can't, I've been telling my friends recently, I can't remember the time in my, in my life since I was a, a very small kid that I wasn't being driven by the quest that the movie portrays until the film was finally out. And now I feel a sense of, of having accomplished what I came for in a, le in a way that I didn't know if it was possible. Um, but I, so I think in a, in a cosmic sense, um, this is what I came here for this lifetime, was to find a certain level of uh, truth and convey it to my fellow human beings uh, in, 
uh, in service to protecting this absolutely rare and glorious planet that we get to live on and which is really in peril. It's interesting. You start with some achingly beautiful pictures of the planet, and, and to think that that is all in peril is devastating. Why was energy your starting point, and what is the relevance of the Taurus to the story? Well, I think the reason probably that, I, that energy was my first really all-consuming uh, calling was that, uh, as I uh, portray in the film, when I was in elementary school, this was during the days of duck and cover, when we had these drills where this air raid siren would go off and, the, the, and we would all jump under our desks and put our arms over our heads. And I remember sitting under my desk just shaking in fear and you know at the, at the same time intellectually I knew that it wasn't real I was being told that it could be at any moment and being under that desk with my arms over my head I was very clear even at a very young age that was not going to handle a nuclear detonation <laughs> so <laughs> if that was the best the adults had to offer I, I needed to do some thinking on my own so I I started deeply questioning then, and it was just a few years later that I was riding on the school bus that I also portray in the film, looking out the window, and uh, the light was blinking through the trees, and I think it helped kind of put me in a state of reverie, and suddenly I was having this full-on vision of this whirlpool vortex pattern that became an atom, and then it became a solar system, and then it became actually uh, the, the field around my body or, or any human's body. And I felt like uh, really deeply that I was being given the gift of seeing something, which I didn't understand really at all then. It was very beautiful to me. It was compelling. And I had the question, I was left with the question, is there, in fact, a fundamental energy pattern in the universe? But I didn't have the answers, and I started going up to the physics lab after sports practice uh, every day and just building things. I... It, <laughs> I chuckled when I saw the, the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and all, all these people were building this, uh, this mountain. mountain in Arizona out of mashed potatoes and everything, because that's pretty much what I was doing for quite a while, just following my inner guidance, but with no intellectual understanding, really, of, of what I was after. And then ultimately, um, it turned out that what I was building, when I finally built what I needed to build, it was a, it was a floating circle of light uh, that I built out of a... a uh, a, a light generator and then uh, blocks of glass that would refract light and I kept bending these blocks of, of glass until it bent the light all the way around in a full circle and like an Ouroboros with the snake eating its tail the light came in on itself and once I finally got that built there was complete satisfaction it was like okay that's what I needed to make and people came into the lab and said well it looks nice but what is it and I said I really don't know but that's what I needed to see so now, years later, I can look back and realize, oh, that was the Taurus. I, w I was given an inner vision of this pattern that mathematicians call the Taurus. And the key to the Taurus is it's the only pattern in the universe that sustains itself in a continuous medium. Mm -hmm. So if our evolutionary imperative is to learn how to build sustainable systems, whether they're economic, energy, communications, uh, whatever kind of systems, um, if it's our job to learn how to line up our systems with what nature does to sustain in a healthy way, then, as far as I can see, the Taurus is, in fact, the universal template for us to follow. And we're being shown it at every level. It's just that we're not being taught it in school or we're not being taught by our uh, parents and teachers how to recognize it. So that's one of the things I wanted to do in the film was portray this fundamental energy pattern uh, in all sort, in, in all its glory, so that we can start to recognize it and then learn to model our systems after it to access, for instance, energy in a clean, safe, healthy way. Because mm -hmm. it's a generative pattern instead of a destructive pattern. It, exactly. It, it, it's a self-creating uh, pattern ongoingly. Mm -hmm. So it's really like every atom in your body, every cell in your body, your body itself, uh, as well as the planet that we live on, the solar system, the, sol you know, the sun that we get our energy from, the, uh, all of these systems are surrounded by a usually invisible toroidal 
vortex uh, that that distinguishes the energy of the system from the energy of its surrounding. It's all connected, and yet each system can be distinct, like a whirlpool in a continuous stream of water. So let's get back to the relevance of this toroid to energy. You talk about UFO technologies and information from crop circles kind of reiterating this pattern. What can, and, and its connection to free energy technologies. What convinced you that free energy solutions exist and are practical? Well, I had been uh, studying um, nature's geometry, how nature builds the material world, really how spirit manifests into into matter for 30 years. Uh, and I didn't even know why, but I knew that I loved doing it and that I needed to do it. And then those studies led to uh, relating to many other scientists uh, from all over the world, particularly in uh, what we call the Sequoia Symposium, a think tank that a, a number of us organized that went on for a, a number of years. And we were looking to see whether or not this torus and then the the structural pattern that comes out of how different toruses organize together, uh, what Bucky Fuller called the vector equilibrium. We were looking to see whether or not <clears throat> this, these two patterns were fundamental at every level. So we had physicists at the smallest level and then chemists at the next level and then biologists at the next level and psychologists and astronomers as the, the scale of scientific inquiry uh, increases. And they all ended up verifying that these two patterns really are fundamental uh, at every scale. But during those conferences, I ran into some scientists who were also inventors or new inventors who were developing alternative uh, energy technologies that I had never heard of. I had heard about Nikola Tesla and that he was on to something, but I had never really studied him. And so I started working with some of these scientists, both theoretically and and ultimately uh, ended up cooperating with some of them in their labs and, and uh, helping some of them with funding and so forth. And uh, I built up trust with them over a decade and was invited into some private laboratories where they were building these free energy technologies. And both my wife, Kimberly, and I got to see some of these things operating. And it just you know, moved us to tears to actually be in the presence of a device that was not plugged into anything. And, uh, and yet was worrying with energy. And, for instance, in one of them, when you would plug in a hairdryer or a, uh, a power saw or a drill, or something, the more devices you would plug in, the more energy it would provide, which is exactly the opposite of our, our traditional system. So it was thrilling to us to see that we do not have any good reason to be fighting over oil or polluting our skies or making people sick with, with asthma and, you know, paying all this money for uh, energy from, you know, fossil fuels and so forth. The technology already exists in multiple labs uh, all over the world. And that's, that was the great news. What's unfortunate is that I, we talk about in the film and the website is that virtually every lab that I was uh, associated with has been uh, raided and shut down by various uh, government uh, forces, um, and the inventors gag-ordered, I mean, literally given a document, which we have on the website, um, which tells them that they need to stop with their inventions, they need to not, uh, not talk with anybody else about their inventions, uh, and really under threat of imprisonment if they continue. And this is all supposedly under the guise of national security. But when we're fighting wars over oil, I would say that having actually clean, safe energy available to everyone would be have quite the opposite effect on our, our national security. I, I, I build the case in the, in the film that I think it's much more political and financial interests that want to control people's lives through controlling energy as well as money and food and, and so forth that, uh, that has us in a condition where the world is being deprived of this new understanding. Yeah, you had a great quote from Kissinger. You said, who controls the food supply controls the people, who controls the energy can control continents, and who controls the money supply can control the world. So yeah, it's, chill it's chilling to realize that that's actually a strategy that has been being implemented for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
it, chilling is, is just too weak a term for it. <laughs> and Miriam, you asked about the connection to uh, the UFOs and crop circles, and that was an even bigger surprise to me. To Once I saw the implications of the Taurus and its uh, application for energy access, you know, I became really curious as to, you know, are, are some of us now just the first ones to be understanding this just absolutely cosmic insight? And it turned out that, as I expected, that, you know, not at all. It turns out that this understanding of the Taurus and the vector equilibrium has been encoded by various cultures through the Egyptian, the Mayan, Chinese, uh, Hebrew cultures for literally millennia. Uh, so it raised the question, um, how did they know about this thousands of years ago so they could encode it very specifically, oftentimes with like five or six layers of error correction that a, a coding expert would recognize? How did they know about this thousands of years ago? And the, there are a couple of, the only two explanations I can come up with. Uh, one is that there were mystics who were accessing, you know, cosmic consciousness, the Akashic Records, whatever you want to call it, and just downloading this information a long time ago. And that may, some of that may have been going on. Uh, and an even more plausible explanation, and possibly an additional one, is that we have been being visited for a long time, for thousands of years, by extraterrestrial civilizations who could be, you know, a million or more years ahead of us. Uh, they would probably need to be if they're actually visiting here from other solar systems, much less uh, other galaxies. And that when they came to visit, they actually left some sort of record of uh, the understanding of how energy works and how they could get here. And it turns out that many of these cultures have, you know, legends and carvings and stories and so forth about these so-called sun gods coming out of the sky in these uh, burning balls of light and actually coming down and, and uh, teaching this awareness. Mm -hmm. So that, that was another mind blower for me. And then when I, when I saw the crop circles, uh, you know, coming in for the last, you know, 10, 12 years, um, at first uh, I was intrigued by them. But, I, you know, I heard the stories about, well, it's actually just some, you know, Doug and Dave and, and, and <laughs> at night, you know, the, they get their beer at the pub in England, and then they go out with some boards and, and ropes, and they go out and actually make these things. And I actually bought into that at first. And then as they started coming in in the hundreds and then thousands, I thought, whoa, you know, Doug and Dave are not only really busy, they're <laughs> really good, because they're outlining patterns in exquisite detail um, that are exactly the same deep geometric understandings that I've come to after 30 years of study. So as I looked into it uh, more realistically then, uh, the, one of the stories that makes sense for the ones that are real, I'm sure that there are a lot of them are being made by people, but there, there are a ton of them that are absolutely unexplainable, you know, no footprints and just electromagnetic anomalies and so forth. But the intriguing thing to me is that hundreds of them specifically describe the subtleties of how energy works in the universe in a way that our traditional physics does not yet. And I think what's going on is that there are more advanced intelligences than we are who are trying to coach us on how not to destroy ourselves, how to access energy in a clean, safe way that would allow us to have a healthy planet. And if we voyage off of this planet, which obviously we're starting to, that we're not uh, taking nuclear waste and nuclear power and all these destructive mm -hmm. things with us. 